How can we learn from the past? It is a story that Americans are challenged with all the time. It's haunting, cruel, tragic, threatening, shocking, unbelievable, evil, illogical, xenophobic, genocide, danger, death. But that's not all there is to this story. I think it was for many, many years a beckoning subject, uh, something we had to deal with, something we had to confront as filmmakers of American history. This is a story in which everyone is challenged all the time. We are challenged as Americans, we're challenged as parents, as children, to think about what we would have done, what we could have done, what we should have done. Even though the Holocaust physically took place in Europe, it is a story that Americans have to reckon with too. Why would we want to go back and look at this dark, dark time? But the opportunity to look at it through the perspective of what does it mean for America and Americans was an opportunity we just couldn't pass up. Part of our national mythology is that we are a good people, we are a democracy. And we are a democracy. And in our better moments, we are very good people. But that's not all there is to the story. We have interviews from scholars and writers who have studied the story, but there's just really nothing like speaking to someone who lived through it and hearing their story directly told to you. My father explained, if we're in two different places, the chance that two of us will survive is bigger. So that was the first time that I really realized it's a matter of life and death. These are important events in American history that need to be understood now and five years from now. Every generation deserves to look at the defining moments of the human experience and try to understand them for the present. This story is beyond our comprehension. It's horrifying. I won't work on a more important film in my professional life. How can we learn from the past? It is a story that Americans are challenged with all the time. It's haunting, cruel, tragic, threatening, shocking, unbelievable, evil, illogical, xenophobic, genocide, danger, death. But that's not all there is to this story.
how can we learn from the past? It is a story that Americans are challenged with all the time. It's haunting, cruel, tragic, threatening, shocking, unbelievable, evil, illogical, xenophobic, genocide, danger, death. But that's not all there is to this story. I think it was for many, many years a beckoning subject, uh, something we had to deal with, something we had to confront as filmmakers of American history. This is a story in which everyone is challenged all the time. We are challenged as Americans, we're challenged as parents, as children, to think about what we would have done, what we could have done, what we should have done, even though the Holocaust physically took place in Europe, it is a story that Americans have to reckon with too. Why would we want to go back and look at this dark, dark time? But the opportunity to look at it through the perspective of what does it mean for America and Americans was an opportunity we just couldn't pass up. Part of our national mythology is that we are a good people, we are a democracy. And we are a democracy. And in our better moments, we are very good people. But that's not all there is to the story. We have interviews from scholars and writers who have studied the story, but there's just really nothing like speaking to someone who lived through it and hearing their story directly told to you. My father explained, if we're in two different places, the chance that two of us will survive is bigger. So that was the first time that I really realized it's a matter of life and death. These are important events in American history that need to be understood now and five years from now. Every generation deserves to look at the defining moments of the human experience and try to understand them for the present. This story is beyond our comprehension. It's horrifying. I won't work on a more important film in my professional life. How can we learn from the past? It is a story that Americans are challenged with all the time. It's haunting, cruel, tragic, threatening, shocking, unbelievable, evil, illogical, xenophobic, genocide, danger, death. But that's not all there is to this story.
as most of you already know by now, we have a film crew here today from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum who is going to be working on a video about the Americans and the Holocaust traveling exhibition. So don't look at the cameras as they happen to get near you. Try to pay no attention to them as they're rolling something back and forth or scurrying around like mice. Just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, if you don't want to be filmed, please move to the two back rows in the seating. But if you're okay with it, great. You are actually helping out the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. So, that said, I have a few more things to say. Uh, first, hello, I am Cynthia Hunt with the Amarillo Public Library. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. The promo clips that you've been seeing uh, while waiting for today's presentation to begin were taken from the new Ken Burns documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust, and I've been asked to say a few words about this documentary on behalf of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Here we go. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is honored that the Americans and the Holocaust exhibition inspired Ken Burns, Lynn Novick, and Sarah Botstein to produce a new documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust. The film was produced solely by Florentine Films. Like the Americans and the Holocaust exhibition, the film explores what Americans knew about the persecution and murder of the Jews and how they responded. It will make an important contribution to our understanding of both Holocaust and American history. The museum was pleased to cooperate with the filmmakers by providing archival and historical resources and expertise in support of the film. Now, on to a little bit of housekeeping. Because we are filming, we need you to turn your phones off if you can, so we don't get any Amber Alerts or something that might disrupt everything. And let's see. We're also filming for the library for use on our YouTube channel. We'll have a playlist of Americans and the Holocaust for you to be able to access. So we will be recording today's presentation. If some of your friends weren't able to make it, you'll be able to say, oh, just go to the Amarillo Public Library's YouTube channel. And let's see. if you do get a call that you absolutely have to, have to, have to take, just answer, say hold please in a very low volume then leave the room and wait until you're behind the outside the meeting room doors and the doors are closed before you continue your conversation. That will make it a lot more enjoyable for the people who are here today and it will make for a much better recording. So, about the Amarillo Public Library's lecture series, Modern Perspectives on the Holocaust. Each of the presentations in this series has been carefully chosen by the library and then vetted by United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and are designed to enhance and deepen your understanding of one or more of the themes contained within the Americans and the Holocaust exhibit. The Modern Perspectives on the Holocaust series has been made possible in part by the Friends of the Amarillo Public Library, the Amarillo Civic Center Complex, Panhandle PBS, the American Library Association, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and Education Credit Union. Today's presentation, Americans and the Holocaust, is being presented by Rebecca Erbelding, who has been an historian, sorry, who has been an historian, curator, and archivist at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum since 2003 and served as the lead historian on the museum's special exhibition, Americans and the Holocaust. She is also the author of the award-winning book, Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe. Both she and her work are featured in the new documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust, where she served as historical advisor. So, without further ado, I give you Rebecca Erbelding. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been really exciting to finally be here in Amarillo. Cynthia, back in January 2020, 
back when we thought that this exhibit was going to come in October or November of 2020, um, invited me immediately to come to Amarillo. And so this is a trip that has been more than two and a half years in the making. And it's my first time in the panhandle. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm going to talk kind of very generally about American responses to the Holocaust with the idea, with the emphasis on the refugee crisis in the late 1930s, in part because I think this is the moment where the United States really could have done more. You know, it's really difficult to get a genocide to stop once it started. And so a lot of the things that the United States could and should, I think, have done were things that we should have been doing in the 1930s, when the threat was obvious to German Jews and then to Jews in the expanding German Reich, but where, when the war had not begun yet and when mass murder had not begun yet. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the War Refugee Board, which is my particular area of scholarship, Cynthia mentioned my book. Um, that is a government agency that started in 1944, specifically by the US government to try to address the ongoing Holocaust. So now we know that it's happening. Now we are going to try to do something about it. And I'll talk about some of the things that this agency did. But what you'll see is that what we're talking about at that point is thousands of people, not millions. Um, not the number of people who probably could have been affected by a change in US policy in the 1930s. Um, all of this with the goal that no matter what you've seen before, whether you watch the film, whether you saw the exhibit, or are planning to go across the street after this is over, whatever you're planning, um, hopefully at the end I'll be able to answer any questions that are still lingering for you. So I'm going to start really by talking about World War I it's really hard to figure out where to start this story because if you're looking at some of the really big questions of this history, what are our roles and responsibilities in the world? Those are questions that stretch generations in American history. So where do you decide where to start? We decided to start with World War I um, and the experience of Americans in World War I. So Americans are only involved in the war for a very limited amount of time. We get in the war in 1917, the war is over in 1918. And the American experience of the war, the, the perceived failure of the Treaty of Versailles after the war was over, the Spanish flu uh, pandemic that wiped out millions of people worldwide, all of those factors led Americans to think after World War I that we just need to stay on our side of the Atlantic. Thank God for the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. We do not need to get involved in anything that is happening overseas. This is also in the 1920s a very racist an anti-Semitic country. There's a rise of a second Ku Klux Klan after the movie Birth of a Nation comes out um, in the second decade of the 20th century. And so by the third decade, by the 1920s, there are more and more Klans members, millions actually of card-carrying Klans members in the United States in the mid-1920s. If you look, this is a, a march um, in Washington, D.C in 1927, and nobody's covering their faces because they don't need to. There are no repercussions for you if you are a member of the Klan at this point. We are a country that embraces eugenic science, this idea that biologically some people are better than others, and that we can racially and scientifically determine what race someone is, and then set up a hierarchy of what races are just better people, biologically superior people, and so we designed new immigration laws based on that. So this, this isolationism after World War I, this desire to stay on our side of the Atlantic and these strands of racism and anti-Semitism that are popping up lead to new immigration laws, first in 1921 and then codified in 1924. And what these laws do is they are based in eugenic science. They are taking this bunk science that is not real and it is putting it into US law. And so when you look back and you think about millions of people arriving in Ellis Island every year, um, in 1907, there's 1.2 million people arriving in Ellis Island in a single year, immigrating to the United States. And for the most part, they don't need to announce themselves in advance. They need to bring maybe $10 with them. There isn't a lot of barrier for entry to the United States. And so when people say, well, I came the legal way, the legal way is basically you show up at Ellis Island and you have $10. <laughs> um, there isn't this long paperwork process. That gets put in place in 1924. So in 1924, 
Ellis Island stops being your port of entry into the United States. Instead, you get approved in the country that you're living in. You get approved by the State Department. You show up at the consulate, you present all of your paperwork, and the State Department in the country where you're living decides where you're going, whether you're going to be able to come or not. And it sets a limit on the number of people who can come every year. So instead of more than a million people, it's a about 150,000 people per year. Not a lot. Um, and that 153,000 is then divvied up by country. Each country gets a percentage of that 150,000. It is based in eugenic science, and this is called the National Origins Quota System. Um, and what it says is that there is, each country gets this percentage, and because it's based in racism, the countries that produce supposedly biologically better immigrants get more visas, and the countries that produce um, racially inferior, supposedly, immigrants get far fewer um, visas. There's also something really missing from the Immigration Act, and that's the question of refugees. So prior to World War II, the United States does not have a refugee system. It doesn't have an asylum system. You can't show up as a migrant. There is only the immigration system. And the immigration system is based in paperwork. So even if you are fleeing, even if you are, you know, we use the term Jewish refugee to talk about people who are fleeing in the 30s. That's the term they used back then. But it doesn't mean that you are coming in under any system other than the immigration system, the same system that everyone else is coming in on if you're coming for economic reasons or you're coming to join family. It is all based in immigration. And so this system gets put in place in 1924. It does not fundamentally change until 1965. So often people think or they hear that um, the United States put new laws in place in the 1930s to either let more Jews in or to keep Jews out as the Holocaust gets going. That's not true. We actually don't adjust our immigration laws at all. We have this 1924 law, and that is limiting people just fine for most Americans who do not want more immigrants into the country. In 1929, the Great Depression hits, and that just doubles down our desire, the American people's kind of general desire to not want more immigrants into the country. Um, President Herbert Hoover, as one of his responses to the Depression, announces in 1930 that all potential immigrants need to prove that they will not become a public charge, that they need to show that they will not be a financial burden once they arrive in the United States. They very, the State Department very strictly interprets this to you, if you want to immigrate to the US, you need to prove that you can support yourself indefinitely once you arrive, even if you never get a job. So you need to have enough money for the rest of your life before you can qualify for immigration. And immigration numbers plummet. In 1933, more people leave the United States than enter. Only 8,220 people enter the United States in 1933. And you look back and you think 30 years earlier it was over a million people. So you can see, yeah, you can see here, um, sorry, I forgot about this slide. So I was showing you um, how these numbers look. So 1926, 27, 28, 29, you can see that about 150, 150 or so thousand are coming. Then the numbers change a little bit and you see what happens after Hoover's instruction. Immigration just plummets. 1933 is also the year that Adolf Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. He is appointed Chancellor of Germany. He comes to power legally in Germany in the end of January 1933. And six weeks later, Franklin Roosevelt takes the oath of office as the 32nd president of the United States. And in his inaugural address, he says, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And for many Americans looking around their country, looking around their world, they see a lot to fear. Um, they see the depression, they see race and anti-Semitism and Jews as a massive threat to the American people. And they also are watching what is happening in Germany. Um, the Nazi party, once they come to power, institutes new laws, they kick Jews out of the civil service, they boycott Jewish owned businesses, they burn books on the street. People are beaten on the streets in Germany. And this is a, actually a major news story in the United States in 1933, right next to news of Roosevelt's New Deal, right next to news of the new administration, is news of what the Nazis are doing in Germany. So you see, this is the Dallas Morning News. This is March 29th, 1929. Or I'm sorry, March, 
1933. You can see on the left side, Roosevelt slashes federal employees' wages 15%. That's a pretty major news story, especially if you're a government employee. Um, and in the same size font, Nazi chiefs order Jewish boycott, even school children are included. That boycott is set for April 1st. This is a paper that is coming out in Dallas May 29th. So if you, you can live in Dallas, Texas, and know that in three days, the Nazi party is sponsoring a boycott of Jewish-owned businesses in Germany. You know that in advance. And there is a massive um, US response to this. Not by the government. The government does not formally respond. The government does not protest what the Nazis are doing. But the American people largely protest. There are marches and rallies in 65 cities nationwide in the spring of 1933, protesting what the Nazis are doing to Jews in Germany. And again, this is almost a decade before the Holocaust begins, before mass murder really begins. But the seeds are being planted. So April 2nd, 1933, this is again Dallas, Texas. Um, they are writing to the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, and it says, at a public assemblage, a large body of Dallas citizens in Dallas, in City Hall Auditorium. So I looked into newspapers, over 10,000 people show up. It's an interfaith rally in Dallas, protesting what the Nazis are doing. And they say, whereas current public and private report give ample evidence of drastic anti-Semitic activities and propaganda in Germany. We, the citizens of Dallas and public assembly, call on you to voice our public protest to the unbearable conditions imposed by the Nazi government on its Jewish citizens. So we can't say that people did not know. This is the spring of 1933. People are paying attention. The problem is people pay attention to things for only a short period of time. And once the story starts to fall off the front pages of the newspaper, replaced by news of the New Deal. Hitler is not doing these big movements, these big kind of public displays of boycotting and book burning after the spring of 1933. And so Americans stop paying attention. And when they stop paying attention, they stop putting pressure on the US government to do anything about it. So the new FDR administration gets away with not having to address this issue, which they really don't want to do. They don't want the Germans to cancel war debt. They don't want the Germans to turn around and say, well, why are you protesting what we're doing to, Ju to our Jews when you have um, Jim Crow laws in the South? Aren't you being hypocrites here? Fair. Um, and they don't have an ambassador who could do that protest anyway. And so the FDR administration really kind of gets away with not having to address this. And over the course of the 1930s, Americans double and triple down on this idea of isolationism and neutrality. So this is a poll from January 1937 where Americans are asked, do you think it was a mistake for the US to enter World War I? And 70% of Americans say yes. Even after, and it is not just, their isolationism is not just based in Germany. You know, Italy invades Ethiopia, Japan invades China, the Spanish Civil War begins. And over and over again, Americans are passing neutrality acts. We are saying we are not going to send any war material to any of these countries. Even if we favor one side or the other, we are not getting involved. We have the Atlantic and the Pacific. We don't need to. For thousands and thousands of people, though, the US is still this land of freedom and opportunity and a, an escape from what is happening at home. There are thousands of Germans, um, mostly Jewish, who are on waiting lists to immigrate to the United States. I talked a little bit about the quota system, about how every country had this slice of the 150,000 visas. Germany actually had the second highest slice of any country in the world. In 1924, um, Congress thought, well, Germany is largely a white Protestant country and they're going to send white Protestant, so-called good immigrants, to the United States. So Germany has a quota of 25,957 visas per year. That's a pretty significant, that's about a sixth of the available visas at all. Um, and people are vying for them. For most of the 1930s, about 90,000 people are sitting on a waiting list waiting for their turn to come up to present their paperwork to be able to immigrate to the US. Roosevelt makes that public charge clause a little bit easier, but for people who are escaping, they are still having to collect their birth certificates, marriage certificates. They have to have a physical from a State Department approved physician. They have to um, have an American financial sponsor. This again is for the public charge thing. You need to prove that you are not going to need any sort of financial support in the US. And so you need an American who is willing to vouch for you, 
who they have to su submit their tax documents, often letters of recommendation from prominent people in their community saying this is a good citizen, this is a person who won't abandon this immigrant if they're allowed to come. It's a very onerous process and all of it has to be done physically. You have to show up at the office. You can't, th there's no computers, everything is going by mail. Um, it is very long and very arduous and sometimes the pieces of paper have to be collected in a certain order or only good for a certain amount of time. And so it is an incredibly difficult process that people are going through. Um, Dorothy Thompson, the famous female journalist in 1938, wrote a book called um, Refugee, what is it? Refugee Understanding or Anarchy, I think is what it's called. And in it, she says, um, it's a fantastic commentary on the inhumanity of our times, that for thousands and thousands of people, a piece of paper with a stamp on it is the difference between life and death. And she goes on to say, and some people have blown their brains out if they couldn't get them. It is clear by 1938 that life is getting increasingly de desperate for Jews in Germany. Um, Germany in the spring of 1938 has taken over Austria, bringing another 192,000 Jews under its control. And those, the Jews now in Germany, um, it absorbed Austria, are immediately subjected to all of the restrictions that had, been, that had befallen German Jews for over the course of the previous um, five years. You know, they're immediately stripped of their citizenship. Many of them have their businesses confiscated. Um, they're beaten on the streets. And Roosevelt sees this. He expands the German quota uh, to include the Austrian quota, but that still only gives 27,000 visas instead of 25, because um, the Austrian quota was pretty small. And he says, well, this is a, this is a refugee crisis now. So many people are trying to get out. You can see kind of barely um, in this poor newspaper coverage. But if you look at the photo on the right, um, those are people lined up in, outside the embassy. Or, well, now the consulate in Vienna, Germany. Um, so he calls a refugee conference. He says this is, a, this is an international crisis. It demands an international solution. So he brings 32 country, countries together to Evian in France. Um, and one by one, all of these, to get them to come, he says, we are not going to force you to change your immigration laws. He knows the U.S. is not going to change its immigration law. And so he says, we won't force you, but we're hoping if everybody comes together, people will make voluntary decisions. That doesn't work. One by one, all of these countries say, we can't do it because of economics. We're still recovering from the Depression. Or some say, we don't have a racial problem in our country and we are not desirous to import a racial problem to our country, meaning we don't want Jews here. We don't want to bring, um, open ourselves up to bringing Jewish refugees into our country. So you can see the headline is, yes, but attitude perils progress at refugee conference. A few months later, Kristallnacht, the attack on Jews and Jewish owned businesses in early November, 1938, is headline news throughout the United States. So here's the Amarillo Globe. You can see it is above the name of the paper, Nazis terrorize Jews. This is the same week as the US midterm elections. Um, so it actually knocks the midterms off the front page only two days after the midterms. This is headline news for the next three weeks in the United States. It is a massive story. Americans do not understand what Germany is doing. Why are they spending their time attacking their own citizens? It is the first mass um, arrest of Jews in Germany just for being Jewish. About 30,000 Jewish men and boys are arrested and sent to concentration camps. They are allowed out only if they promise to leave the country as soon as possible. At this point, Nazi policy is to force them out, to, get, um, to make life so difficult for people that they will choose to leave. They steal all of their money before they go. So by this point, um, any Jewish refugee who is trying to leave has to make a list of all of their possessions. That is then taxed at a very high rate. Every single thing you own, not just money, but your physical possessions. And so this is the catch-22, right? Because the Nazis want you to go, but you have to find a place to go, and you might be both Jewish and not be able to show that you're, you won't become a public charge. And so for thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, they are caught in this conflict, not being able to find a place to go. Americans, Roosevelt does a couple of things. 
Um, one of the things that he does is he brings back the U.S. ambassador as a sign of protest. The U.S. is the only country to remove its ambassador from Germany after Kristallnacht. And we don't have an ambassador in Germany again until after the end of World War II. He also, at the request of his Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins, he agrees to allow German Jews who are here on tourist visas, people who are here temporarily to visit family, to look for a job, to try to find a sponsor, to stay indefinitely if they don't feel safe going home. And so we have um, stories in our collection, we have materials from people who happened to be in the US when Kristallnacht happened and did not have to go home. Roosevelt announces in advance, I legally can extend you for six months, but I will extend you again and again and again until it is safe for you to go home. And so people stay, are able to stay for the entirety of the war and become US citizens during the course of it um, because of this decision. And the American people are sympathetic to the plight of German Jews. So if you look on the left, do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? Okay, 94% of Americans disapprove of what the Nazis are doing. The same people are then asked, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles from Germany to come to the United States to live? And 72% of them say no. So this is, this is the, the hope, thoughts and prayers. <laughs> we are very sorry, we are very sympathetic. However, we are not interested in being part of the solution. These polls, I mean, if you think about, there are very few things that would poll at 72% in the US today. We are incredibly divided, right? And people were equally divided on most issues back then, except for the question of immigration. Consistently, between 70 and 90% of Americans do not favor increasing immigration. And they have their individual reasons. For some, it's race. For some, it's anti-Semitism. For a lot of people, it's the Depression. For a lot of people, it's just xenophobia. Any sort of foreign thing feels strange and scary. But these feelings and the political pressure that Americans are then placing on their politicians, which is almost nothing, nobody is being pressured to allow more immigrants in, um, that has real repercussions for people who are struggling to come here. So World War II begins September 1939. The United States, of course, is not going to be involved. Roosevelt announces right afterwards that the United States will remain a neutral nation, but he can't expect Americans to remain neutral in thought. So you don't have to, you can favor one side or another, but just, just so everybody knows, we're not getting involved. And for most Americans, they, they call this the phony war. William Bora, a senator from the South, says this is the phony war. It's, there's not a lot of fighting. You know, Poland is defeated. Britain and France wage war, but are they actually sending people abroad? No. Um, the, the difference is the spring of 1939. So in April, 19, I'm sorry, the spring of 1940. In April 1940, Nazi Germany turns away from Poland and turns west. In April, they invade Norway and Denmark. In May, they invade uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. Americans who may not have, you know, memories of Poland or relatives in Poland or may not have traveled to Poland don't feel particularly sympathetic um, or at least certainly not willing to get involved. France is a little different. Americans have very romantic feelings towards France. Soldiers had fought, you know, in France in World War I. And so film footage coming out of Hitler at the Eiffel Tower, the Nazis marching down the Champs-Élysées, that is something that Americans start to pay attention to a lot more. And they wonder, how is it possible that the Nazis defeated the French so quickly? Um, France mobilized more than three million men to defend the homeland, and they are defeated in six weeks. And for many Americans, they look around. One of the things that I should have mentioned is that because we were isolationist, because we were neutral, because we had the Atlantic and the Pacific, the United States, in a way that we don't remember now, pared down its military. We actually destroyed perfectly good working ships in the 1920s because we don't need them anymore. Let's spend our money elsewhere. So when World War II breaks out, the United States has the 17th largest army in the world. We are not a military superpower. We won't be one until after World War II. And so Americans look at France being defeated with their 3.5 million men, and they look at our 250,000 person army and our incredibly large coastline. <laughs> and they start to worry 
that the Nazis might be placing spies and saboteurs inside the US, waiting to bring the country down so that as soon as they land on our coast, they will be, they will be able to defeat us. So June 1940, only a month after the Nazis invade, Americans are asked, do you believe that Germany has already started to organize a fifth column in this country? A fifth column is spies and saboteurs. So a country can be attacked by four sides, north, south, east, west. It can also be attacked by a fifth side, and that is from within. So the fifth column is the fifth group, this group attacking from within. And 71% say no, and 22% don't know. So 93% of Americans are willing to entertain the idea that the Nazis are already placing spies and saboteurs inside the US, ready to rise up as soon as they cross the border. This is ginned up and encouraged by the FBI. By mid-June, they are getting 3,000 tips a day from people who are turning in their neighbors, who are turning in people who they suspect of, of potential spying and sabotage. Um, you can see on the right a warning from the FBI that the war against spies and saboteurs demands the attention of every American. And a lot of that gets wrapped into American xenophobiaism about immigrants. So America Magazine, April 1941, Hitler's slave spies in America. This is the idea that Roosevelt himself encourages. He says, Jewish refugees may not want to be spies, but their family back home might be being held hostage in exchange for these acts of spying and sabotage once people are allowed in. And so, of course, the State Department starts to really look into people even more than they had been. You know, in 1939, the U.S. actually fills the quota. They give out every single legal visa. In 1940, they come close. They're off by 15. So between those two years, more than 50,000 people, almost all of them Jewish, are able to come to the U.S. Um, the U.S. accepts about 225,000 Jewish refugees between 1939 and 1945, more than any other country. But we could have done much more, but there's no appetite in the US to do it, in part because of all of the factors that I mentioned and because of this fear that these people could be spies. By 1941, um, the ship ticket is really the most difficult thing for you to get if you're getting out of the US. It's no longer the visa. It's no longer, you know, if you can put together all of your paperwork, um, you can largely immigrate to the US. You're competing with a lot of other people. You're still waiting on your waiting list. But the ship ticket becomes a huge problem because the war has expanded. And so you can see here um, all of the ships that are bringing Jewish refugees to the United States. This is in 1938. And what you'll see is that they're coming from all over Europe. Um, all of these ships are carrying thousands of refugees over the course of a few months. This is what it looks like in 1941. So all of the um, cities in the continent of Europe that are grayed out have all closed to US bound passenger transportation. The war has touched those areas. The Nazis have invaded and those ports have closed. And so if you are a Jewish refugee trying to get out by the summer of 1941, really by the summer of 1940, you have to get to Lisbon. So you need entry and exit visas for all of the countries that you're traveling through. You need to arrange a ship ticket in a country that is five countries away from you and then make sure that you can get there before you can even apply for your visa. So for people who are trying to get out, it, your, your chances of success just diminish and diminish and diminish. In the summer of 1941, the Nazis invade the Soviet Union and this is when mass murder is really able to begin. There is really no US presence in Central Europe. There's certainly no US presence in the Soviet Union as the Nazis move forward and as the Einsatzgruppen move after them. And so there are no American witnesses to what is actually happening. Um, and it becomes much, and much more likely that the US will ultimately get involved in the war. We've passed Lend-Lease. We're starting to materially aid the Allies significantly. And many Americans think it is, including President Roosevelt, that it is inevitable that we are going to get involved in the war. But by the summer of 1941, um, the threat feels very real for Americans. The spy stuff is happening. So the US decides that we are no longer going to allow visas for anyone with relatives in Nazi territory. Even if you yourself get out, 
if you have close relatives still in Nazi territory, you are no longer eligible for a visa. The Nazis announced that all US consulates in the territories that they and their allies occupy will close. So by July 1941, if you are Otto Frank, the father of Anne Frank, for example, living in Amsterdam, you no longer have a consulate that you can go to to apply for a visa. And that's what happens to the Frank family. They apply for their US immigration visas and then the consulates close and they become trapped. And by October 1941, Nazi Germany makes immigration illegal from its territory. So this is the moment, and the, the years before this are the moment where the US really could have opened our doors, but there isn't public pressure to do so and therefore there isn't congressional pressure to do so. The administration is not doing so, um, and mass murder begins in Europe. Pearl Harbor um, finally brings the US into the war. And it takes another year, almost, for the US to actually understand that mass murder has begun. Um, remember, we don't have eyes and ears on the ground in Europe anymore. And in the areas where the Holocaust is happening, where, where millions of people are being rounded up and, and largely at this point shot, um, Americans are not seeing this. They're not really hearing about it. Um, there are a couple of articles that appear in American newspapers, but they are largely sources out of the Soviet Union say that 25,000 people have been shot outside of this town. And for many Americans, they can dismiss that. You know, this is, what are you talking about sources out of the Soviet Union say? Do we trust the Soviet Union? No, of course we don't. They're, they're barely our allies. And nobody, there's nobody in the American press who's verifying this. This sounds like World War I anti-German propaganda. And also, why would Germany be doing this? They're trying to win a war. Why would they divert resources from trying to win a war to focus them on mass murder? So many Americans think this is just wartime propaganda and there's no reason that we should pay attention to it. They, that feeling is shared by the State Department, by many in the State Department. And so in August 1942, a man named Gerhard Rigner, who was the um, representative of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland, he learns third hand from a German businessman that the Nazis have a plan of mass murder. That all of the rumors that he has been hearing in Switzerland from all of the areas that are controlled by Nazi territory, which is everybody surrounding him because he's in Switzerland, so everything that Switzerland touches is, surrounded, is controlled by the Nazis. He is hearing inside Switzerland that the Nazis are planning to bring Jews from all over Europe to the east and by the end of the year, murder them. Um, he says between three and a half and four million people will be murdered before the end of the year. And so he decides he is going to send this information to America. Uh, the head of his organization in America was Stephen Wise, the most famous rabbi in America, uh, in New York City, someone who knew President Roosevelt. And Rigner figures if Roosevelt knows about this, surely the US will do something about it. He sends the information and the State Department says this is not credible. This is a war rumor. There's no sense in getting people riled up. And so the State Department quietly tries to shelve the message. They do not deliver it to Stephen Wise. But Rigner also goes to the British and the British decide they will deliver it to the representative in London. And the representative in London sends this cable via Western Union. So openly via Western Union alongside birthday greetings and all sorts of things that people sent telegrams for is the message that finally gets through that the Nazis have a plan to murder all of the Jews of Europe. This information, Wise takes it to the State Department, not realizing that they've already tried to shelve the message. And the State Department agrees that they will look into this. It takes them three months. Um, and finally, in November 1942, Stephen Wise announces to the US public that the State Department has confirmed that more than two million people have already been murdered and that this is part of a larger Nazi plan of mass murder. You can see how small these articles are. Some of them are, appear on the front page, many of them don't. Um, some say, like the one on the left, Rabbi Wise asserts. So it gives you a lot of room as an American to decide whether or not you believe this. But Historians tend to track this as this is the moment where the public learns, where it, you know, it becomes public information that the Nazis are, are trying to do this, that the Holocaust is happening. And in part, that's because this is the moment where the press starts to treat it seriously. This is when more and more information is coming out and it is treated as credible. 
there's enough pressure on the U.S. after this, in the couple of weeks after this. You know, the Jewish communities in America throw a national day of mourning on December 2nd, 1942. Um, that they, in mid-December, the U.S., the Soviets, the British, and a group of nations in exile issue a statement. They condemn the ongoing mass murder plan, and they vow that after the war is over, we are going to punish the perpetrators. We're not going to try to rescue people, that doesn't seem feasible, but after the war we're gonna have war crimes trials, and we're gonna punish the people who are doing this. And they say, you know, and I think there's some reason to think that they're right saying, you know, there's nothing we can do to rescue people now because November 1942, the same month that this information reaches the American people, the Allies have just landed in North Africa. They are pushing through North Africa, they are thousands of miles from the killing centers, which is where most people are being murdered now. And so the, the Americans don't have boots on the continent and won't for another six months. But there is still more that we can do. And in 1943, there is more and more information coming out. It's now being treated as credible. And there's no, more pressure on the US government to do something about it. Um, this is a photo from October 1943, a rabbi's march on Washington, 400 Orthodox rabbis marching on Washington, standing on the steps of the Capitol, demanding some sort of rescue response. Nobody's quite sure what that would look like, especially with the war going on and millions of American soldiers going overseas, but surely something can be done besides just winning the war as soon as possible. At this point in, the in time, the Treasury Department gets involved. The Treasury Department has been um, in charge of US sanctions, and they start to investigate the State Department. Why is the State Department compressing information and keeping information from the American people? They discover that that has been happening and that not only had all of this stuff with Rigner happened with that cable, but that the Assistant Secretary of State had personally instructed US diplomats in Switzerland to stop sending information about the Holocaust to the United States. That that information was trickling out to the activists, and so the State Department had decided that if the activists don't know what is happening, they won't put pressure on the US government to do more. So Henry Morgenthau Jr. was the US Secretary of the Treasury. He was the only Jewish cabinet member. He was a very close friend of President Roosevelt, and he was someone who was actually a very good manager, terrible with money, tr um, which you would want in a Treasury Department um, secretary. But he is a, a very good manager and trusts his staff, and he's a meticulous record keeper. So a lot of what we know about what is happening in the Roosevelt administration come from what are called the Morgan Bad Diaries. This is every piece of paper that crossed his desk as Treasury Secretary between 1934 and 1945, every draft. Every time he talked to the President, he immediately um, transcribed what they had said, um, what his memories were of the conversation, and he recorded his staff meetings, all of them. So you can go online now and you can read the, court, the discussions that the Treasury Department staff are having throughout this entire period, including when they start making these discoveries about the State Department. So Josiah Du Bois, who was one of the Treasury Department's general counsels, says in December 1943, Mr. Secretary, the only question we have in our minds, I think, is the bull has to be taken by the horns in dealing with this Jewish issue. Get this thing out of the State Department into some agency's hands that's willing to deal with it credibly. For instance, take the complaint, what are we going to do with the Jews? We let them die because we don't know what to do with them. And then, Randolph Paul, who was the general counsel of the Treasury Department, says, we are speaking as citizens now. And I always found that really powerful, this idea that they are not saying, this is what we should do because it's a good political decision, this is gonna be popular. They are saying, we are citizens of a democracy, and we feel like our country is better than what the State Department is doing. And so armed with all of the evidence that they collect about the State Department, they write a memo, which I have worked in Washington for a long time, and this is not what memos are called. It is called Personal Report to the President on the Acquiescence of this Government in the Murder of the Jewish Population of Europe. And they say in this memo, we leave it to you as to whether the State Department are war criminals in every sense of the word, but if you don't do something now, the United States will be forever complicit in the murder of Jews. And when they go to him with this in January 1944, they bring along another document, which is an executive order saying this is your chance to do it better. Henry Morgenthau, the, the Secretary of the Treasury, his father had actually been also in government. His father had been the US ambassador to the Ottoman Empire during the Armenian Genocide. 
So he had been on the ground in what is now Turkey when the Armenian genocide was happening. And so Morgenthau, in the meeting with Roosevelt, says, you remember what my father saw in Armenia. That is what is happening now in Europe, and you remember that we can do it better. And so he looked to the past and then said, this is what we can do now. They bring an executive order creating what is called the War Refugee Board. The War Refugee Board um, was a U.S. government agency tasked with trying to rescue Jews. It opens in January 1944. It fundamentally changes U.S. policy overnight. So beginning in January 1944 through the end of the war, the U.S. has an official policy of rescue and relief. They do a whole host of things. You can read about it. It's a book that is across the street at the public library. It's on display. Um, <laughs> or whatever local library that you have. But I'm going to go over just a couple of those things, and then we'll get to your questions. So the board was headed up by John Paley. John Paley was the head of U.S. sanctions. So they moved him off of this and put him in charge of rescue. He was 35 years old. He had never been to Europe. Um, he was the child of a Swedish immigrant and a German immigrant. He grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and came to Washington because he believed in making change. Um, he assembles a team largely of Treasury Department colleagues to affect this agency. Um, and they have a policy that is really threefold. You know, he's never been to Europe, so he doesn't quite know what to do, and, and all of the information that's coming out is coming out kind of piecemeal, and so you have to figure out, you have to have a strategy of how you are going to try to save lives during a world war when you're not quite sure even what is happening. So the first thing they decide to do is that they are going to um, try to convince the Nazis and their collaborators to stop the killing, um, try to just get them to stop. Two, they're going to try to move people who are on the margins of Nazi territory in places like France or Romania into areas that are safer. And three, they're going to try to keep people who are deep inside Nazi territory in Poland um, and Hungary alive as long as possible, alive long enough for the Allied armies to come in and liberate them. And so just to give you a couple of examples of what they do. So they, drop, they send radio broadcasts and drop leaflets by planes over Nazi-occupied territory. They have prominent um, Americans of Hungarian origin, like Bela Lugosi, record um, radio messages that are then transmitted into Hungary, saying, my fellow countrymen, please do not do this. Why would you want to be a war criminal now? Um, do not be part of this. Uh, this is a leaflet that was dropped over Germany in the spring of 1943 after um, the Nazis have invaded Hungary. And this one was written, I mean written, by Roosevelt. It was actually written by the War Refugee Board and Roosevelt signed it. Um, but it warns, once again, we are going to have war crimes trials after the war. Please do not do this. Um, you will be punished with the entire power of the U.S. government if you participate in this. I found out about this particular leaflet because I met a teenage boy who found one. Um, he was in Germany, he was a member of the Hitler Youth, and he said that this is the moment that he learned about the Holocaust, that Allied propaganda like this was very smart because on the back side of this, they printed the recent bombing raids of that area. And so you would get this leaflet that said, we just took out the factory here, we just took out this factory here, we have bombed this area on this day, and for you on the ground, you know all of those things are true because it's right around you. And so he said that this is how he knew that this was true as well. The um, War Refugee Board also opened up the Fort Ontario Emergency Refugee Shelter. Remember how I said that there was no refugee policy. This is the only group of people who were brought outside of the immigration system for humanitarian reasons. 982 refugees, many of them recently liberated from Allied-occupied Italy, um, brought to a small town in upstate New York, Oswego, and they are kept there uh, for the duration of the war with the idea that they would be sent back afterwards. They came as guests of President Roosevelt. Um, this was a plan that was put in place very quickly. They had not thought about this at all. Um, case in point that a number of the women were pregnant and then the, the uh, Department of Justice emergent immediately starts panicking. Will the children be birthright citizens? These are people who are supposed to go back. Like, all of the questions that we still have about immigrant and refugee and migrant populations are starting here in 1944 in the small town of Oswego, New York. So the refugees are kept here for the entirety of the war um, behind barbed wire. The kids are able to attend public school, but they are not allowed to sleep outside of 
the confines of this camp. And finally, uh, it takes several congressional inquiries um, and another eight months after the end of the war for them to finally be allowed to enter the United States as potential immigrants. They actually have to go to Canada, register, and then come back to the US. Um, but this was a plan put forth by the War Refugee Board. They hoped that it would be the first of many camps, that we would be able to bring many Jewish refugees to the US. But by the time the refugees got here in August, the idea was, well, the war is going to be over soon. Why would we bring all of these people here and then send them back? And of course, the war wasn't. The War Refugee Board also, in November 1944, received a report uh, that is now known as the Auschwitz Protocols. It was written by escapees from Auschwitz, which at this point was the final killing center still in operation. More than a million Jews died in Auschwitz. And this was written by two escapees um, who escaped in the spring of 1944, made it out to Yugoslavia and then to Switzerland, wrote their report, very detailed, very graphic report, in which they estimate that 1.75 million people had been killed in Auschwitz. We now know this is, this is an overestimation, but it's very detailed about when transports are arriving and how and the process of arrival and selection and gassing. The War Refugee Board um, asks, uh, or actually doesn't ask, um, the other agencies in Washington before they send it out to the press. They send it to 200 newspapers nationwide, tell them to embargo it for Thanksgiving weekend so to give them time to write their articles, and it is front page news, Thanksgiving weekend 1944. Um, this is the Louisville Courier, and you can see how small the font is, that they've sourced photos, that they have drawings in there, um, and they are trying to provide the citizens of Kentucky with very detailed information about the process about what is happening in Auschwitz. This is the fall of 1944 before, you know, any American has seen an image of liberation. And a couple of weeks later, or I'm sorry, a couple of days later, the Washington Post publishes an editorial entitled Genocide. This is the first time that that word is used in an American newspaper. Uh, it had been coined by a, Pol a Polish Jewish refugee who himself lost much of his family in the Holocaust. And he had spent 1943 and 1944 saying, what is happening right now is a new kind of crime. And that kind of crime needs a new word. And so he coins the word genocide. And the Washington Post in this editorial says, the War Refugee Board has introduced the American people to a new kind of crime. This is a new word for that crime. And of course, now we all know the word genocide and have used it not just to refer to the Holocaust, but to other crimes that have met the same criteria. The War Refugee Board also um, distributes 300,000 food packages into concentration camps in the final weeks of the war. And as you can imagine, this is a bureaucratic nightmare because you have to gather the food, you have to use ration points during the war, you have to, in this case, ship it to uh, Sweden, have it disguised as a Red Cross package and get the Red Cross to distribute it to Dachau, to Ravensbrück, to Theresienstadt, to Sachsenhausen, 300,000 food packages to try, again, to keep people alive long enough for them to be liberated. The War Refugee Board shuts down when the end of the war happens. Uh, they go to President Truman, who is now president after Roosevelt dies in April 1945, and they say, you know, there is still a massive displaced persons problem. You know, the war in Europe is ended, camps have, are, are now being liberated, but this is not a problem that is going to go away immediately, and we should keep going. <laughs> and Truman says, no, this is a wartime agency, and you should shut down. And so, you know, between 1933 and 1945, the United States fundamentally changes. You know, we are no longer isolationist. We are no longer um, a military, we are no longer have the 17th largest army in the world, for sure. Um, millions of women have joined the workforce. So many things in the, we've recovered from the Great Depression. So many things change between 1933 and 1945, but one thing doesn't change, and that is largely our willingness to admit immigrants and refugees. Um, after the war in December 1945, Americans are polled and only 5% think that we should admit more people than we had before the war. And they cite the same reasons. These are people who are clearly ill. We need jobs for the boys who are coming home. We, um, these are not the right sort of people. And so that, that aspect of our history is something that we continued to struggle with, even after the war, even after we had seen 
you know, sometimes the implications of what happens. The U.S. is not responsible for the Holocaust. The United States could not have solely stopped the Holocaust. You know, Hitler was determined to do this, but there are probably thousands of people who could have made it out had the U.S. made um, different decisions. So that was a very long time. Cynthia, did you want to come up and say something for a second, and then we can um, get to any questions that anybody has? So thank you so much. Okay, we are going to be taking some questions now. If you would like to ask a question, raise your hand. I will get over to you as soon as you have asked your question and Rebecca starts answering. If there is another question that someone wants to ask, go on ahead and hold up your hand so that I can make your way, my way to you. And that way we can get to the questions one after another. And while she's answering one question, I can get ready to have you ask yours, okay? Okay, anybody want to ask a question? <clears throat> We're all familiar with the famous names of concentration camps such as Auschwitz and Terezin, but what is the actual number of camps that the Nazis used? Yeah, the, I mean, this is something that my colleagues have been working on for a long time, because even if you look back to wartime maps, you'll see a few hundred, or if you're just looking at killing centers, there's five or six. And so I think this is a question a lot of people have, have been asking. Um, and a few years ago, my colleagues decided that they were going to create an encyclopedia of all of the camps and ghettos, defining these as places where at least 100 people were kept for at least 30 days, right? You have to have a definition. And they have thus far found 44,000. And so, again, this idea that people didn't know, that this was hidden out of sight, I think the data um, shows that that is not possible. That there were camps in the middle of major cities, you know, and a lot of companies were using forced labor. And so these forced laborers were often working side by side or in another part, protected part of the same factory. As, as others, and so um, I think it has become harder and harder for anybody to argue that an average person living in under Nazi control wouldn't have known about it. They may not have known about mass murder, but they definitely knew um, about the camps. And, right. uh, sorry, just to add one more thing. Dachau, when Dachau opened, uh, the very first of Hitler's camp, concentration camps, that was in the New York Times, that was on the front page of the New York Times. So Americans knew about camps too. Yes, in the uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum, there is a uh, display and it shows the map of the train, s mm -hmm. train system. And next to it, there's a picture uh, of a letter or the actual letter from the Allied Air Force. And they say, sorry, we must divert all resources to the upcoming campaign mm -hmm. and we will not bomb the train system. What are, what are your thoughts on that? It's the, the idea that they had ability to, to stop Jews from being deported and end that. End that yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's really complicated. Um, and this is a place where I feel like the museum, to some extent, um, is... So the photograph that you're talking about, it, there's this big aerial photograph that's on, a, on the wall at the museum and the photograph has been analyzed. So you can see this is, you know, here's clearly a line of prisoners, this is where you can see smoke, this is where you can see trains lining up. Those photographs were actually not discovered until 1979. And so we present them because they're historically absolutely fascinating, but I think people get the impression that this was stuff that had been identified and analyzed during the war, that we knew that this train was coming here and that these people were lining up and that we chose not to bomb. Um, bombing is an incredibly complex question. Um, it is really the spring of 1944 before the Allies have the capacity. They, ha they establish a base in Foggia, Italy. And so for the first time, the Americans have the capacity to fly over Auschwitz and back on one tank of gas. So before that, it would not have been possible. And so for millions of people, millions of people had been killed at that point. More than five million people had been killed. Um, and so it's not an effort that would have stopped the Holocaust, but it is an effort that, that could have potentially disrupted it. 
historians do not argue anymore about whether we could have done it. We know that the Allies were flying over that area because the Allies actually bomb Auschwitz twice. We bomb Birkenau twice. If you've ever, or, I'm, yes, we bomb Birkenau twice. If you've read Elie Wiesel's book, Night, he talks about the September bombing of Auschwitz and how the Allied bombers were falling and how he hoped that they would keep falling, that the, the, they would continue to bomb this camp. Um, we bomb it by accident, though. We are aiming at the Buna facility, which is the forced labor facility about five miles from Birkenau. And so what that shows you is that we had the capacity to do it, but that our aim was really bad. <laughs> our, we, were, we did not have precision bombing the way that we do now. And so for the most part, the average miss was about five miles. And so I think I have a hard time personally with the idea that we knew it was there, we had the capacity, and we didn't try. But I also have a problem with the idea of we, we could have just bombed the camp, like not hit the gas chambers, not hit the rail lines, and bombed the bunkers. And then what, how would we look back on that history? And so I think it's a question in which there's no right answer. We look back and say, we should have done it and we didn't, or we look back and say, we did it and it was a terrible, like the Nazis turned around and said, we didn't murder anybody, the, no the Americans did, we killed people who might have otherwise survived. This is the problem with Hitler, with um, history only moving in one direction is that we will only fight about the hypothetical <laughs> of what would have happened had we tried, but we will never know what would have happened had we tried. So with all the propaganda that was used to um, keep refugees out, the propaganda about spies, um, how many, if any, legitimate spies were actually um, uncovered? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are definitely German spies. Um, at the time that this kind of fear of refugee spies was happening, they had no case to point to, zero. Um, they had a lot of like reports from people who said, I was on a ship crossing the Atlantic and I heard people whispering and this is what they were whispering about. And like Roosevelt trusted that these were coming from, in one case coming from a Jewish ambassador saying, this is what I'm hearing. Um, and so that, you know, the actual information was not legitimate, but there was a reason that Roosevelt was saying this. It wasn't just, he wasn't making it up whole cloth. Um, in 1942, there's a huge spy trial in the US, and one um, man who was half Jewish and came to the US as a Jewish refugee, and again, there's no refugee policy, but he came as a Jewish immigrant, had been interned in Dachau, arrested after Kristallnacht, fled to England, came to the US and spied for Germany. Very complicated guy. <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, he was also one of the world, at the time, the world's expert in the lost city of Atlantis. And someday I'll write an article about him because it is a very fascinating story. Um, he is the only one. He is the only one. And again, when all of this was happening and they were changing rules and there was no, there was no case study to point to. There was no example. Mm -hmm. Why did this, this virulent anti-Semitism come to a head at this point in time? <sighs> That's a great question. I think eugenics had a huge part to do with it um, because the, the world was being divided into races. And this isn't, like, this isn't races about skin color. I mean, skin color had something to do with it, but I mean, obviously I want to state, uh, flat out race is not real, racism is real. So human beings are biologically identical. Um, racism though, the impact of how people perceive you is very, very real. And the impact that your perceived race can have on you is very, very real. Um, and so during this entire period and during all of American history, our idea of race and racism changes. So for a while, Italians are a separate race, Irish are a separate race, people that we would now theoretically consider white are a separate race from other white people. So it's all cultural and it's all um, based in, in perception and prejudice, right? So at this time, this idea of eugenics is not based in black and white and brown. It is based in your family heritage. So Slav, um, Spanish, Italian, French, all of these are considered different races. 
And of course, the history of Europe tells us that's ridiculous, right? People are cross, these are not big countries. People are crossing borders all the time and intermarrying and moving. And I mean, the history of the US doesn't do that. Like I am not more than 10% anything. My family has been here long enough that if you ask me what my race is, I'm, I'm white and I'm American. Like I don't, I don't know. And that was true then too, you know? Um, people's t ties to Europe were a little closer, but not really. But the Nazis perceived Jews as a race. And they legislated with the idea that Jews were fundamentally biologically different and inferior. And a lot of people picked up on that in the US too, right? So there's French, Slavs, whatever, and Jews. And so in the 1930s, anti-Semitism is actually at the peak of what it will be. Um, and that, again, has tragic consequences for the Jewish refugees trying to escape. Any other questions? Hands? Going once. Can Going I add once. one more thing? Just because I don't want to add, I don't want to end exactly on that. <laughs> like that's pretty dark. Um, okay. Please do. So you had, you had asked a question about the propaganda. And I think it's worth pointing out that there were so many Americans and so many organizations. They were unfortunately in, in a huge minority, but they are making significant effort. There are people who go overseas to try to rescue Jews. If you were here last week and saw Steve Pressman's um, presentation, it's not just the Krauses. There are organizations that are here that are, you know, their staff is interned because of the war, because they're still in Europe, desperately trying to help people get out. And some of them are doing amazing work um, Hyas and the, the American Quakers write a, a booklet that I still love and that still holds up called Refugee Facts. And it was a statistical argument about the power that refugees and immigrants have in the U.S. And I'm, by power, I mean this, that they'll create more businesses, that they employ more people, that refugees and immigrants are net goods for the American people. Um, and they have diagrams and pictures and you could read it today and it would be as true as it was. And so there are people who really are pushing against all of these stereotypes and prejudices and many of them are still active today and so this, if this is a cause you care about, you can absolutely get involved still with these organizations who are still doing this work. Um, but I think it is important to point out that, that even though you have you know, the 72% of Americans who don't want more refugees coming after Kristallnacht, there's 21% of Americans who do and who are fighting for this. They, they largely lose, but they're the ones who keep the quotas from being diminished. You know, the, there were more efforts in Congress to lower the quotas and to stop all immigration than there was to raise them. And the reason that that didn't happen is because these organizations and the people who believed in them were fighting. And so I think that does give us some hope and that's a much better place to end than, <laughs> than talking about how Jews are not a race. <laughs> so thank you so much.